Hello, adventuresses. Today is a very exciting episode. I'm speaking with Tamar from the Netherlands, and she tells us about her adventure walking 600 kilometers across Jordan with her donkey. That's right. She actually went to Jordan, found a donkey, and walked this trail. And that's not the only adventure she's done. She's also done something very similar in Mongolia. She bought some horses, and she basically just rode around in the wilderness for four months. She's also done lots of other adventures. She was hunting and doing survival in New Zealand, and she was traveling around a lot, and she has some very exciting adventure ideas coming up in the future on reindeers. So a whole lot of interesting, fun things that we cover today in today's episode. So you are not going to want to miss this, so be sure to stick around. Before we get started, I want to take a moment and ask you to subscribe to our podcast and leave us a review so that others can find us. Check out our website for our podcast episode show notes and to read articles from amazing women having adventures on horseback just like you. Today's episode is brought to you by Silversteed. Check out their website for their breathtaking handmade silver jewelry. I completely fell in love with the equestrian collection with a huge selection of bracelets, necklaces, charms, pendants, and earrings. Check it out under silversteed.co.uk. That's silversteed.co.uk. Stay tuned as we are soon launching the Adventurous Collection together with Monica, the creative mind behind Silversteed. So you don't want to miss our beautiful upcoming jewelry collection. As usual, you can find the link in our show notes on equestrianadventuresses.com forward slash podcast. Be sure to join our Facebook group if you haven't already. This year, I will be traveling to some exciting destinations to film our upcoming YouTube documentary series, so be sure to keep checking in on our website for updates. And lastly, if you love what we do at EQA and you want to support us to help us continue to bring all this amazing free content, please consider becoming our premium member. For as little as a cup of coffee each month, your support really makes a difference. As a premium member, you'll have access to all of our bonus podcast episodes, our bonus YouTube behind-the-scenes footage, bloopers, all kinds of extra fun things. Check it out on our show notes and in our website at equestrianadventuresses.com. Thanks for listening, and cue the music. We are explorers. We are trailblazers. We love to do what cannot be done. We love to test our limits, cross borders, and we love the freedom horses bring us. We seek lands without fences. Who are we? We are equestrian adventuresses. We are a community of women who love horses, travel, and adventure. To infinity and beyond! And now your host, Crystal Kelly! Hello, adventuresses. Today, I'm talking to Tamar. She's actually in the Netherlands right now, and she just came back from Jordan a couple weeks ago. So, very excited to talk to her today. So, hi, Tamar. Hi, everybody. Hi, Crystal. (laughs) Good to hear you. (laughs) So, okay, you did this super awesome adventure, but before we dive into that, I just want to get a little bit about you and, like, where you where you're from, and how you got into horses and traveling in the first place. Yeah, good. Um, I'm from Holland, obviously, from Harlem. And I was born and raised a city girl, (laughs) always lived in the city, and never had anything with horses. (laughs) But I had lots with traveling. And I did some horse trips uh, on the Azores and Australia, and I really, really fell in love with horses. God, they're amazing animals. And I thought, this is a cool way to travel. Um, so at, I was first a Michelin star chef, and later I became an investigative psychologist. I worked for the police, helping them with murder and sex offense, uh, terrorism, stuff like that. I was trained by the FBI. Okay, um, wait, but wait, at wait, the wait, age of, wait. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How do you go from a chef <laughs> to working <laughs> with the FBI? What? What? How? <laughs> <laughs> I love to change my life every so few years. Now I started working in a kitchen when I was fifteen, 
So till the age of like 22, I was doing really well working high class restaurants. But at the same time, I was also studying psychology and criminology and law. <laughs> I just did a whole lot of things at the same time. And then I quit my job in the kitchen and I started working for the police for a few years. <laughs> and, right. and this is my dream job. This was where I wanted to end up back then. But that changed. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you're working with the FBI, you're doing some, obviously, some hardcore, intense work, uh, meeting these okay. types of criminals. So what what was the next step? What shifted? Yeah, so I, I was loving it. I was having a great time. But uh, the world was also calling. I wanted to see more, explore more, do more, learn more, meet other cultures. Um, so yeah, at the age of 28, I retired. <laughs> I quit my job and I uh, sold my house and everything I owned, gave it away. And I built a bicycle and I started cycling. And, and this bicycle brought me all the way to Australia. And uh, in the meantime, I was researching the least inhabited country in the world. Um, I wanted to go and explore the nature. And this turned out to be Mongolia. And we'll, I think we'll have another podcast about that story. <laughs> yes, that's definitely. where I bought my first horse. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. So you're in Mongolia so bought, and you buy a horse. Yeah, I bought a horse and a camel and I got a dog. And with these three animals, I traveled for four months on my own through the Altai Mountains in, in amongst the nomads, the eagle hunters. And I just love this adventure with horses, with, with animals um, in general. is such a beautiful way to, to go around. I felt like a mother <laughs> taking care of my children and at the same time, these horses brought me to places I could never have gone another way. I couldn't hike there. I couldn't go on a motorbike. We went through swamps and through wild, cold rivers, um, high mountain passes, things like that. It was uh, it was an eye opener. And after that, I just just wanted to be around animals as much as I could. And was this your first time around horses, Mongolia? Yeah, sort of. I did a I did a two week trip in the Azores. Um, few years before um, riding horses every day um, and then in Australia I took a few lessons here and there but that was about it yeah I learned uh, I learned on the way <laughs> okay so when you were in Azores you were taking lessons or you were just going out on little trail rides you know at, at a walk speed with the other tourists or how was that yeah um we were sleeping at the stables. We were staying there and every morning we had lessons inside and every afternoon we'd go out for trail rides. So on those volcano rims, on the beaches, through the forests. And within two days, I was not with the beginner group anymore, but with the experienced group it was just two old ladies that wanted to gallop all the time. And I just <laughs> followed them. And it was, uh, it was a great time. I had a blast. <laughs> I thought, wow, why did no one ever told me horse riding is so much fun? <laughs> Okay, so you went from city girl to country girl. Yeah, yeah. Somehow I took a, a wrong turn. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So when you, you know, started your Mongolian adventure, and obviously, like you said, we'll have plenty of time to talk about that in another podcast, but I just want to, you know, when you left that experience, so you traveled around for four months on your own horse that you bought, what, Yeah. I guess, you know, something like that will, will change you forever. And what was your, yeah. your thinking after that trip? What was your takeaway? Yeah, it was so, so beautiful. I thought, geez, this is, <laughs> this is what I want to do forever. I didn't want to leave. Actually, I overstayed my visa for five weeks. Uh, I just couldn't leave them. because They were part of my family now. I'm sure all of you have that with your own horses, too. Um, so I've been looking for ways to get back and I go back there every year now and ride my own horses again and I take people there now. I'm, I'm now qualified as a wilderness guide and survival instructor and take people into very remote areas uh, with or without horses, preferably with. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've been looking for ways to sort of duplicate this, this feeling. So you kept your horse, so it's, it's still your horse. Yeah. It's still my horse. Yeah, it's with the family I bought it from, a beautiful family of eagle hunters, very, very nice people, and they take really good care of him. And, um, yeah, I can go back there and, and ride her a few months every year. Wow, amazing. So, because yeah. I know that you can't, you know, export horses from Mongolia, but you, you did no, it, I right. think, the better way, 
which is just keep your horse there and, and visit it every now and then. <laughs> yeah, they're at home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so after Mongolia, what what happened? Oh, many, many, many things happened. <laughs> I think this podcast is too short. <laughs> I tra- So I travel the world full time. So I'm always going from one adventure to the next. I rode reindeer in Siberia. <laughs> I uh, went on skis over the glaciers in uh, in Norway. I built a snow cave in France, lived in that for a while. I did my survival trainings in the Canadian Rocky Mountains, did some horse packing stuff there. Uh, so lots of things. But it brought me this last march to Jordan. And I was going to walk Jordan for 650 kilometers from the north on the border of uh, Syria to the south, into the Red Sea. And that's a long distance trail. They just opened like a few years ago. No one really has done it yet. There's, there's not really a trail. You're just following an arrow on your GPS, basically. And I was walking this trail for only two or three days when I saw this donkey. <laughs> and the donkey was living with a family. And I was invited with the family. I stayed with them for two nights. I uh, went to their daughter's wedding, everything amazing. But I fell in love with that donkey. And I sort of jokingly asked the owner, hey, is, is she for sale? <laughs> and um, without me expecting this answer, he said, yes. <laughs> I'm like, oh, what do I do now? And of course, he asked me a way too high price. And I said, ah, oh, it's okay. I'll, I'll just keep walking. But I couldn't get the idea out of my mind anymore to go with this beautiful <laughs> animal. And in the end, we agreed on a better price, and I I bought a donkey, and all of a sudden, <laughs> I was walking Jordan with my new friend. <laughs> okay, okay, so this is this is good stuff. But let's uh, one second. What? How? So you just decide one day I'm going to walk 600 kilometers across Jordan. How does this idea come up? You know, you're traveling <laughs> yeah. around, and you just throw darts at the map, or <laughs> how did you decide yeah. I, I want to walk across Jordan? Yeah, that's that's a good question. How do these ideas come into my mind? There's so many ideas in my mind. <laughs> um, yeah, I always like to try something completely different. So before I was in Jordan, I was in New Zealand, and I did a big trip with my friend Miriam, another Dutch girl. We went through the mountains, under the glaciers for three months without bringing any food. So no... Uh, yeah, no food basically, and we brought guns and fishing rods and snares, and we hunted and foraged all of our food. And this was really extreme and really hard, and it's a miracle we're alive. But I thought after New Zealand, I want to do something completely different, and I'll go to a country I have no idea about. I don't know Jordan. I don't. I've never been in an Arab country before. It's Arab culture, and everybody's scared of this Middle East. Because it's bordering Israel and Saudi Arabia and Syria and Iraq. Um, But I thought Jordan should be sort of okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I heard about this long distance trail and it was so new. I thought it's still interesting because, you know, I don't want to walk the Pacific Coast Trail with one million other hikers and we see each other every night at the same camp spots. That's not the, the unique experience I'm looking for. And because this was so new, I thought this maybe I should do it now. This is the time. Perfect. So you're in Jordan and you buy a donkey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and what was the donkey's name? Her name was Eustra. Eustra. And and did you have any prior experience with with donkeys? How big was she? Yeah, she was pretty big for a donkey. Very strong and healthy. Uh, everybody commented that she was big. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, a bit smaller than a mule, but definitely big for a donkey. Um, And no, I had zero experiences with donkeys before, but I thought if I can handle horses and camels, um, I should be fine with a donkey. And did she come with a little little pack that you can pack your stuff for? No. So the first thing I did is I walked her to town and I went to the local sewer, sewing man and I picked some fabric and he sewed her a bag (laughs) I got I had a blanket with her a really thick blanket for underneath with cinches and I had the local smith uh, make me a stake for uh, for the ground to tie her up at night and yeah I just went through town to everybody that I thought could do something for me and uh, I improved 
as I went, uh, looked for better ropes because almost all the ropes are plastic there. It's really shitty. Um, so every time I saw something better, I, I bought it <laughs> from, uh, from, yeah, from Bedouins even or from farmers. Um, now, I'm guessing yeah. that there's some kind of, you know, language gap. So were you, how were you able yeah. to describe to them the items you were trying to purchase? Was it a little bit of a struggle? <laughs> Yeah, that's always funny. Um, thank God there was quite a lot of reception there for the phone. So that was new. Usually places I travel, there's no phone reception. But this time I could just Google a picture or uh, use Google Translate to show them what exactly I'm looking for. Um, but most people already knew before me saying anything because almost everybody owns a donkey in Jordan. And that was the real fun thing here as well because everybody's like, what, what are you doing with this donkey? <laughs> <laughs> and I got lots more invitations just because I had the donkey and I had all the children riding on the donkey, little uh, donkey rides around. And <laughs> it was really fun. Okay, so she became uh, very famous. <laughs> yeah, she's probably the most photographer donkey of all of Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess they were being very helpful and trying to, you know, give you stuff that they thought you would need. Yeah, Jordan is incredibly safe and incredibly friendly and hospitable. I could not believe it. I've traveled five continents and more than 60 countries, but Jordan was really the safest and the nicest country I've ever been to. Unexpectedly, yeah, really amazing. Right. So, you know, you're, is it like a small, you said it was Bedouins, was it like a small town or, you know, the place that you found Eustra or was it a bigger city or... No, it was a small town. There's there's only one big city, but it's a small country. So only the capital, Amman, is the big city. And the rest of them are all towns. And then you have Bedouins scattered uh, across the desert. Uh, so this was in a small town or just before a small town, just a farmer with his three wives <laughs> and, uh, and a bunch of children. Um, yeah. And the starting of the trail, I know you said it was like near the border, near Syria. So did you take buses or something yeah. to get to the start or did you just yeah, walk I, from the airport? I, I, <laughs> no, I flew into the capital and I spent a day or two <laughs> to get my uh, visa extended to find gas for my cooker. And what else? I had another mission. Well, anyway, so just to, to get ready and, and do my shopping, of course. And then I took buses all the way to the north, and there's some beautiful ruins there. There's a lot of ancient ruins in Jordan because it has this whole history of the the Christian Empire, the Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire. Everything is there. A lot of biblical stories take place there. So there's lots of things to see on the way as well. It was really cool to, for instance, walk up the mountain where Moses walked last um, before he died because Moses was not allowed into the Holy Land. And from that mountain where is now a church to commemorate him you can see into the holy land into israel you can see into syria the sea of galilee you can see the dead sea um so that's the sort of things you're passing while you're <laughs> while you're out there walking your donkey <laughs> wow wow so it really makes you feel like you step back into time i, I can imagine yeah yeah and things start making sense like uh, near the dead sea all of a sudden i saw all these black lava stones and this is from the story of sodom and gomorrah the, the cities that that God destroyed <laughs> and there was a big uh, outburst of fire and, and it was raining black stones and you still see these black stones laying there. You can visit Lot's wife who turned into a salt pillar when she turned back and had a look. Um, yeah, it's incredible. Wow. I'm, I'm assuming this is a story from the Bible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have much information about stories from the Bible. So if you want to just give us a brief. Yeah. Well, maybe the most interesting story of the Bible is from Bileam, because Bileam had a donkey. Ah, oh, there we <laughs> and go. Bileam walked the streets, and his donkey wasn't always doing what he wanted her to do. She was sometimes um, being stubborn, of course, as a donkey, and she didn't want to take the route that he asked her to take, and she would take a big detour. And later in the story, it reveals that the donkey was seeing angels that were standing on their path <laughs> that he couldn't see, so she sometimes had to take another route because she couldn't go through this angel. <laughs> so every time my Eustra 
didn't want to go where I asked her to go. I thought, oh, it's okay. She's seeing an angel. We'll just take another t- another route. <laughs> and and ha- and was you sure happier avoiding the angels when you just let her do her yeah. thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We really uh, learned to speak each other's language, and I, I started to understand wanted to wanted to do anything or what she could and could not do. And she was really growing up as well. In the beginning, she wouldn't step over the smallest little crevasses. And later she was jumping like a horse over one, two <laughs> meter, meter uh, obstacles. Wow. And yeah, I let her choose her way sometimes. And sometimes she had to do what I want to do. <laughs> so how old was Eustra? She was three years old. Oh, yeah. okay. So she was a, she was... a youth. Yeah. Yeah. So you... Load. I, I'm assuming because you were going to walk the trail, everything you had could fit in a backpack. So now do you sort of shift it over mm-hmm. onto Eustra? Yep. Yeah, I put a lot of the stuff on Eustra. Um, but <laughs> at day four, I asked her to go up a way too steep mountain and she pulled back and she pulled loose. I couldn't hold on to the rope without falling off. <laughs> and she ran off with all my stuff. <laughs> Oh. And it took me a while to uh, to find her back. Thank God I did. But then I realized, oh, maybe I shouldn't have my uh, important things, my wallet and my sleeping bag and my food, my water on her. So I started wearing my own backpack again. Okay. <laughs> and she was just carrying a whole lot of extra water and food and things that I could do without in case she would break loose. But she never did that again. Okay. So when you would come to a new village or or a small town, you would just sort of stock up on food and water? Yeah. Jordan is not a very wet country. There's hardly any water there. And if there's water, it's usually polluted. So that was the big struggle, this uh, trip. Right. Finding clean water. Yeah. Yeah. For me and you, Stra. Mm. Wow. So how how did you manage that? Yeah, so because I was walking the Jordan Trail, um, I contacted the Jordan Trail organization. <laughs> There's an organization. And they pinpointed on a map where you might find water. Say if it's been raining or whatnot, you might find a spring here or a pool there or a well, cistern, things like that. So I had all of those on a map. And I just uh, made sure that I had enough <laughs> enough water with me if, if one of those would fill I could go to the next right so you were able to manage and and everything was fine yeah just about I must say because the south of Jordan is really really desert amazing I, I never knew that desert has so many colors and so many forms <laughs> One day we were just walking through sand all the time, like the true sand dunes as we know them, but with also very rocky desert or days through high canyons. Um, every day was on a different planet. But in the desert, uh, the water is, is very scarce and you can organize water drops, like you can organize that a local will um, yeah, will come and, and bring water to your campsite uh, with the car. But I I wanted to do it properly. <laughs> Is this like a Bedouin yeah. app on your phone? Or <laughs> yeah, yeah, from the Jordan Trail organization, they give you a few phone numbers you can call, and then there's with a little bit of English. Right. Perfect. <laughs> you have to tell them where you're gonna be when, and and hope uh, pray to God that there will be water. <laughs> right. Wow. So uh, did you ever? Not yet. Yeah. Did you ever go a day without water or? Yeah, yeah, I did, but I was also prepared for it. So we had enough. So this was used to, I was still carrying my own heavy backpack and she was just carrying a whole lot of water extra. Mm. Yeah. And what was the sleeping? So it was great. Sorry. So what was the sleep? Oh, I was just going to say, so what was the sleeping situation like? Yeah, I started out with a tent and I must say March and April are the best months to travel Jordan weather-wise. But this March was exceptionally cold and rainy, (laughs) so so we were lucky. Um, So we had uh, temperatures below zero, and (laughs) I did not expect that. So I was really, really happy that at the last moment I did pack my winter sleeping bag and and slept in my tent. The rain was great, though, because it meant there was a whole lot of lush green grass for you stress. I was happy with rain. (laughs) It was greener than ever. Um, but halfway down the trip, I met someone from Amman, from the capital, and I gave him my tent. 
Because <laughs> I, I really enjoyed sleeping outside under the stars and next to Euster. So I started sleeping on her blanket as well. I, I was too lazy to blow up my uh, air mattress. I slept on, on her blanket outside under the stars right next to her. And it, it was beautiful. And and was there any other people nearby or was it just sort of miles and miles of, of no one else? Mm, really depending. In the north of the first half of the trip, there was there was almost always people and uh, many, many nights I was invited to people's houses because obviously when I'm there with my donkey, I don't just want to be grazing on someone's land. So if I found a good place to camp, I would go ask at the nearest house, like, is it okay that my donkey is eating your grass? <laughs> and nine out of ten times they'd say, yeah, of course. And, and what do you mean camping? We have a place in the house. Please come in. And I stayed with all these families and I learned a lot about the culture. And I, I could sit with the women without their headscarves. You know, interesting things that the other meal travelers will never see. Um. But in the desert, yeah, we would go for days without seeing anybody or sometimes just a Bedouin tent. But if you don't knock on the door, you don't see the people. But usually we would we would go and say hello and maybe buy some uh, grains for Eustra because there was not much to eat for her in the desert. Uh, so we got a bit of everything. No. And I guess one of the, I don't know, let's say the elephant in the room you know, you're a solo woman traveling in the Middle East. And like you said, most people, the stereotype is, oh, it wouldn't be safe as a woman to be alone <laughs> at night in the middle of the desert where no one, you know, are you going to call the police? Who's going to help you? So yeah. what was your, yeah. I don't know, precautions to keep yourself safe? Did you have any concerns or difficult situations or how did you manage your safety? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the good, fair question. I get it all the time, of course. <laughs> I traveled as a woman alone through Africa, through Colombia, four years on a, on a bicycle and horses through Mongolia. I, I do everything as a woman alone. <laughs> and my experience is that, uh, yeah, everybody has this opinion, has this thought, uh, oh, it might be unsafe, meaning that everybody wants to take care of me and they want to take me in. And if there's a family that sees me, Wanting to camp alone, they go, no, 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 it's not safe. You have to stay with us. We'll take care of you. <laughs> so I think actually it's my biggest advantage. <laughs> yeah. It's not yeah. a problem. No, that's yeah. that's exactly. And I've experienced a lot of exactly what you're saying in my travels as well, especially in India or something. Yeah. All of the aunties, like, you know, they just surround you and uh, that you have a tribe. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're never if you don't, if you're only alone if you want to be alone. <laughs> you don't have to at all. Yeah. Well, so you're walking and tell us a little bit more, like what's, how, how many days is this taking you? What, what's the, what's happening? What's the process? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I had only five weeks in Jordan and I wanted to do 650 kilometers. So I had to keep moving. Uh, so I would get up before sunrise which is my natural rhythm anyway, so it was not a chore. I, I wake up uh, with first light and I make some breakfast and I pack donkey and we start walking. Also because you kind of want to uh, start early because of the hot sun later in the trip, in the desert especially, you want to be early. Um, and then I keep walking as long as I can until the uh, sun goes down at about 5 or 5.20, pretty early in the day. Um, and I want to have camp before the sun sets. But I also want a really, really good grass for Eustra. So sometimes I just keep walking and walking, walking forever to find some uh, a good place where she can feed. Uh, so this was the main, uh, the main thing every day, finding good grass or enough, uh, enough food somehow. Uh, so long days of walking for five weeks in a row. And sometimes we take a rest day, and this was a rest day for Eustra then, and I'll go canyoning or visiting the, the Dead Sea, uh, visiting Petra, this ancient site, 7,000-year-old amazing site where all these uh, beautiful things are carved from the rocks. Uh, unbelievable. And um, we stayed there and slept in our own cave. We found a cave. <laughs> uh, we slept there in an amphitheater. Uh, so we were, yeah, we're just stepping back in history all the time. 
Uh, sometimes we stay with the Bedouins and I help them with milk milking the goats and making yogurt. I help the women with foraging. I learned a lot about the edible plants of uh, Jordan. This is my from them. Um, yeah, so it's it's very easy existence. Just get up, eat, walk, eat, walk, eat, sleep, <laughs> and do it again the next day. <laughs> And I can imagine, you know, it's a very mental thing to just have to keep yourself moving. Or do you just, do you have a set goal of, you know, this is how many miles I want to walk today? Or were you just playing it by ear? Yeah, my goal was always to make it to the water source. So that was sort of keeping me moving. I couldn't stop a day because then I wouldn't have enough water. Um, so yeah, that's a natural <laughs> goal. And, and how many miles roughly were you traveling each day, would you say? Yeah, but um, miles, I'm not sure. We're doing oh, sorry, between, kilometers. 25, kilometers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, between 25 and 30 kilometers a day. Okay. And I was actually pretty, pretty impressed that you still could do it. I was expecting that she would slow me down a lot, but in fact, she didn't at all. And there was some really, really rough terrain because all the time you're going up and down canyons. Uh, many days we didn't. The one day we would go down at a thousand meters a kilometer and then the next day we would go up again a thousand and then the next day again down so we crossed a lot of these deep deep canyons and i thought it might be too hard for her big boulders she had to navigate around or jump over or through rivers and up to her ears in the cold water i was expecting a whole lot more uh, trouble but she grew up so fast <laughs> She became a really, really bra brave donkey. And um, this one time we met another uh, group that was traveling with a Bedouin guide with his donkey. And I had to help him out because his donkey wouldn't do, <laughs> do the things that my Eustra would do. <laughs> and, and I see all these guys, they're hitting their donkeys with sticks and they're screaming and kicking them. And I wouldn't do any of that. And, and she would follow me even without a rope. So, yeah, I was super proud of her. It was incredible so at what point were you able to just take the rope off and say okay she's part of my my herd now yeah I'm, i must admit i was a bit chicken to do that um it, i did it until only in the last week um because this was my experience from mongolia we traveled for four months as a pack so after one month i i took the ropes of the camels and they would just follow us. <laughs> they were sometimes eating a bush and looking up and go, hey, hey, where are you guys? And we would be far ahead. <laughs> they didn't hear us scream and they just <laughs> start running after us. Like, hey, hey wait for us. <laughs> and all this stuff fell off their pack and we had to repack the whole thing. But it was great to be able to let them free. So I wanted to try that with you, Strap. And uh, it worked. She'd stay with us. And every time I come out of a tent or I don't know, walk somewhere close to her, she'd come running to me. And that was uh, this, yeah, this, this feeling of being a family that's so special. So you're helping the other Bedouins. Were you teaching them how to correctly convince their donkey? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not. I'm not preaching anything, but uh, they tried to get their donkey over some uh, obstacles and it wasn't working, so I took the, the rope and... Um, I tried another route, which seemed easier and just easy stuff like that. Mm. But uh, yeah, it was cool that my donkey could do it and their donkey couldn't. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's terrible. You no, think that's cool, but it's, yeah. So they'll they'll learn by example. That's that's the way to do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so you said that this was a trail for it's quite yeah. new for a couple of years. But was there an actual? trail which you were following which was easy or did sometimes you know like you said it's desert like how do you know which direction yeah. you need to go yeah no so there's not an actual trail and there's no signs and uh, nothing so it's a trail only on the gps which is telling you this is where you can find water and this is um, what most people what we would recommend you to walk in a day what's doable uh things like that so yeah it's like through the desert you're just following an arrow in the GPS on um, where you're going. But same in forests or the same through canyons. Um, sometimes there's only one way to go down a canyon. Everything else is just sheer cliffs. So you follow the, the, um, the arrow on the GPS to find the right way. 
Um, so that, yeah, that's why I'd recommend the Jordan Trail right now because there's no trail. We call it a trail, but it, there's no trail. It's just um, researched by people that this is a way you can walk without walking on the highway and without uh, walking on roads at all. And um, yeah, really seeing the nature and the beauty of Jordan. And did you on this trail ever come across an obstacle or something where you're like, oh my gosh, how am I going to go around this or through this or over this, <laughs> especially with Eustra? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, some of these canyons were so steep and so scary. I was scared on my own even, and I could totally imagine Eustra being scared. And yeah, some one time it took me, I don't know, like two hours to convince her that it was going to be okay. And I tried everything, standing in front of her and behind her. And finally I took her pack off and that helped a lot. Um, yeah, sometimes she wouldn't even fit through these, these canyons were so narrow. I had to take her pack off or I, sometimes I just <laughs> shoved her through. I had to push her through. <laughs> um, and sometimes she would jump super high things and then the other little step she was too scared of. So, yeah, all the time I was trying to find a new route that she would be comfortable with and sort of decide together <laughs> on where we were going. But, uh, yeah, surprisingly enough, she made the whole trail. She did it. Wow. That must be a very victorious feeling. Yeah, amazing. I to totally took into account that we probably won't make it. We'll probably have to do something else and go back to the road or whatnot. But no, um, we did it. <laughs> it's super victorious, absolutely. Wow. Yeah, you know, I, I experienced that a lot. I, I drove a car from England to Mongolia, and at one point in Turkmenistan, Ooh. all of the other ralliers, there was a sandy desert, and most of them, instead of trying to go through the sandy desert – they just sort of admitted defeat, parked their car and rode in an SUV with the locals to the door to hell. And, you know, for <laughs> me, it was kind of like, no, I'm in my car. This is an adventure, me in my car, and I'm getting this car yes. to the door. And, and you know what? I did. I got stuck in the sand and I had to dig it out and it was hilarious. And I pushed my car and, you know, I, I made it. I made it to the door to hell. And just the <laughs> awesome. fact that I made it, it, it was almost yeah. like it was more fun when I reached the door to hell than the people who had just, you know, paid to ride in the SUV. Absolutely. So I, yeah, I can yeah, definitely Yeah, you have to imagine. go through some hardship to feel that, yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah, true. that you, you really, like, you take every small victory and you're just like, yes, that's why I'm here. Yeah, exactly. No, that's great. Yeah, so, I gave you so many hugs. So I'm like, wow, I'm so proud of you, you straight. <laughs> did amazing today. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Let's so, do it again tomorrow. <laughs> right, exactly. So you're filming this this bond with with your little donkey, something that you never thought you were going to do. I can imagine. Um, so yeah, I, I know. At, at some point, you you met another traveler, and you guys started traveling together a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So on the trail, I met one other guy. I haven't hardly seen any other hikers. I think there was maybe a handful of people doing it, uh, but I met an Australian guy, Graham. And uh, I asked him, look, how do you feel? You might want to walk with us for a day. <laughs> he said, yeah, all right, I'll try it. And he walked with us for a day. And it was great because um, he would only walk towards Eustra if she stopped. And then she would start walking again. And every time he took a picture or, or had to go to the toilet or something, she'd, <laughs> she'd refuse to move. She wanted him to be part of the family. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, it was really, really lovely. And he fell in love with her as well. So he traveled with us for uh, for a few weeks then. It was really, really great. It was cool to have a, a proper family. Also, because we met so many um, people in Jordan. And they all ask us, of course, who are you? Are you friends or are you husband and wife and whatnot? So we told everybody that Graham was my husband <laughs> and that Eustra was my baby. <laughs> So now we had a we had a real family. <laughs> yeah. Aww. <laughs> so and I, I'm assuming because you know I lived in the Middle East too, and a lot of people they just if they see a man and a woman together, they just automatically oh that's your husband. So you just kind of it's just easier yeah. to roll with it sometimes. I felt. Exactly. Yeah, we just didn't want to swim against the stream because there's also not enough language to to make them understand that I just met him and that we're only friends and uh, that actually I don't know this guy at all. But yeah, we are, 
<laughs> taking care of this donkey together. Okay. It was too hard. Like, I want to be honest to everybody, and we tried it a few times, but it made everything so complicated. <laughs> yeah, now it's a cultural discussion. It's not just, you know. Yeah. 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 And and the same thing with people always asking me, why is your big backpack not on the donkey? I'm go- How am I going to say, oh, oh, I want a break and uh, it's okay. I, I like walking with a big, big backpack. <laughs> that doesn't resonate. So I tell them, look, I work for police. This is my training. And then everyone's like, oh, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, it's, it's an art that you have to navigate, definitely. So you guys are going through, you, you said you stayed in Petra in a, in a cave and you're continuing yeah. the trail. Was there any other just really amazing sites that you saw? Um, yeah, so I think the most amazing was this Unkais thing where we started. It has a lot of uh, historical uh, value and a lot of ruins. Then this was the mountain of Moses I told you about. Then we went to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is always... Uh, Beautiful. Uh, Petra, and then we finally ended up in Wadi Rum. So this is this desert city, uh, which we know from Lawrence of Arabia, which was filmed there, famous movie. Uh, The new movie, The Martians, (laughs) was filmed there. Uh, Star Wars has been filmed on some of these places. Uh, So yeah, you walk through sort of familiar terrain. (laughs) We've seen it in the movies, and now we're here. Um, And there's Bedouin people scattered around which is interesting because i've got a feeling that most of these people choose the bedouin life because jordan is is reasonably wealthy or at least you know people can live a sort of modern life in the cities but a lot of the bedouins the first thing they do is tell me i'm a bedouin i'm a bedouin they're really proud of this uh, heritage the same as i saw with the nomads in mongolia they're fighting for their existence and um yeah they're happy to show us their way of living uh, which I'm always interested to see these ancient cultures that still live in harmony with the nature. And there's so many skills there. I think I've I've missed out on in my childhood, and I think many with me. Uh, so I love to soak up those skills. And yeah, so I also I'm a wilderness guide, and I give survival training to to pass on these skills, make sure they don't get lost. It was um, yeah, it was cool to hang out with them. So. You know, you're touching on this sort of a bit throughout. So you were when you were in the police and stuff and you had your your training. So this survival training that you're talking about, was this through the police or did you take a private course before your little New Zealand hunting on your own? Or how did you prepare (laughs) yourself for all this? How did you go from city girl to survival girl? (laughs) Yeah, this all came later, uh, to be honest. I always traveled a lot. And I stayed with jungle tribes in Colombia and I stayed with aboriginals in Australia. And uh, I'm always looking for these uh, cultures, the native Canadians. And last year in Canada, I did an official training um, to get my papers to be wilderness guide and survival instructor. So this is all post police time. Um, This is just me finding it interesting. (laughs) And and do you have any advice or tips for any of the ladies that that are interested in surviving in the wild? Yeah. Yeah. It's such a personal journey because you can do it super extreme and you can just go for a nice hike on a, on a trail that's already set. And I think maybe, you know, start, start easy. Where's your comfort zone? Step over it a little bit and, and keep stepping over those boundaries. That's what I did anyways. Uh, first, I started cycling in Europe, nice and safe and easy, but I did stay in my tent every night and I, I started foraging more and I started fishing more and I learned how to hunt and uh, then I went more and more remote and more and more in the wilderness, so farther, further away from everything and, you know, I got a satellite device in case uh, something happened. Um, yeah, you have to start thinking about filtering your water, you have to learn how to make fires in every sort of circumstances. Uh, I stopped bringing a stove. I always cook on open fires. Uh, I only brought a stove in Jordan because there's hardly any wood and I didn't want to destroy the nature. Um, so, yeah, you, you just keep stepping over boundaries and maybe, you know, find mentors. There's always people that can teach you things. Uh, so go go with people. Go with me. <laughs> go with uh, you. Go with, I don't know. There's plenty of options um, to learn. Yeah. And would you recommend, uh, I don't know, like a course or something or just, I don't know, try 
just try it. Yeah. Yeah, of course you can. There's plenty of courses out there, bushcrafting courses and whatnot. Um, but I must say, you really don't have to. You can learn all of this by yourself. You just go and do it. <laughs> and I can imagine, like, especially in some of these male-dominated countries, you know, as a woman and you're hunting your own food and you're and the men show you, like, see you around your own fire, which you built, and most men can't even build their own fire. I can imagine that's pretty, yeah. like, empowering feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was great. Yeah, that's why we want. it was a female-only <laughs> expedition. <laughs> oh. Exactly for this reason. It just feels different. When there's a man, he's always in the front. He already navigated. We just follow. Uh, he already made the fire, already shot the deer, and is already cooking dinner when we finally come to camp now. <laughs> Right. So it's, uh, no, we can definitely, women can do all of this, of course, um, but it does make people react differently and it does make you feel differently as well, I must admit. Yeah. Does, I it, like it does the food taste better? Or, yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's great. And I think, you know, it's so, I mean, it's so easy to just go to the supermarket and buy the prepackaged food. But to like so know great. how to forage yeah. your own, I don't know, plants and stuff. That just sounds like, why do I not know how to yeah. do that? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, there's a lot to learn. You have to start over in every country. And it's also dangerous. And you can get very sick. We all, all seen Into the Wild. Uh, I almost died of eating a poisonous rhubarb plant. I was sick for two years after a bad mushroom. <laughs> Um, so it's not it's not uh, something you just do. You have to really get into it and be enthusiastic about it. Learn from people who know exactly what they're doing. Uh, but yeah, it gives a whole different dimension. So I learned from these Bedouins in Jordan, and we started foraging, and and the food is so much healthier too. Um, it's a different ball game. So so what was the food? Tell us what the food was like in Jordan. Yeah, Jordan is very Middle Eastern, of course, lots of falafel and hummus. They eat a lot of olive oil and everything. Um, they eat a lot of za'atar, which is a mix of oregano and sesame seeds. So they just dip their flatbreads into the oil and into the za'atar. And there were some rice and chicken dishes. Somehow they eat a lot of chicken. You would expect in a country where everybody has goats and sheep, uh, that we would eat more of that, but I didn't see any of it. I didn't eat any goat. It was unbelievable. We always uh, were offered chicken. Um, so I understand they, they, they save these goats for later in the year when it's the season. There's some some sort of holiday, and then the prices go up humongously, and then everybody sells. Um, but a lot of dairy products. Um yeah, that was about it. And then we foraged uh, for some greens, sort of spinach-like uh, stuff. And that was it. Yeah, so the good thing about having a donkey and not having to carry everything in my backpack is that I could, <laughs> when I found the town, I could really stock up on fresh fruit and fresh, fresh vegetables. And yeah, we ate like kings. It was great. Cool. So you're getting further along into the trail and you've seen the Dead Sea so you're starting to wind down your adventure and what, what are you thinking at this point? You know, what are you going to do with Yustra? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was just you and now you yeah. have this family. So what, what are your thoughts at this yeah. point? Yeah. Oh, it was terrible. <laughs> it's so painful. So at first you think, Oh, it's a great idea to have a donkey. And it's like, Oh, look at our nice little tight family. And then you start thinking about the end and, it is going to end and I can't take you to home. I don't even have a home. <laughs> um, I'll have to leave her here and find her a better place. But then we started walking through the desert. I'm like, oh, I don't want to leave her in the desert. There's hardly anything to eat here for her. And I got a lot of offers in Petra. But these are all tourist donkeys. They, they looked horrible. They were not taken well care of. They had to work really hard. I don't want you to be a tourist donkey. <laughs> and then I wanted to bring her back to her previous owner but he didn't have any money to have her pick it up and I, more and more I talked to him I thought you know maybe I'll just pay for a taxi to bring her back and he can have her for free at least she has a good place to stay but I understood that he was going to sell her anyways when I bring her there so that was not an option <laughs> I was starting to panic <laughs> what am I going to do I need to find her a good place but yeah in the man and I managed because every 
everybody I met asked if she was for sale. Everybody wanted to buy her. So I've been, just been collecting phone numbers as we went. And I found this man in a nice bio nature reserve. Lots for her to eat. A uh, nice guy. Doors. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. You started to break up a little bit. Goats. <laughs> sorry. You started to break up a little bit. What oh. was What was that? You found a nice guy and? This nice guy was living in Dana. It was a bio nature reserve. And he housed her when uh, it was raining and storming. And there was thunder outside. Uh, and he saw her under the tree. And he told me, oh, she can stay inside with me, with my goats. <laughs> so she stayed with his 20 goats in a, in a building inside, hiding from the bad weather. And he wanted to buy her. And she would just be a shepherd donkey um, helping his son to herd all the goats and sheep. And I thought that was, a, that was a really, really good deal. And I'm still in touch with him now. And he said she's, uh, she's happy. So I choose to believe that this is true. <laughs> so he picked her up. He came with a car all the way to the Red Sea, the end of our trip. He picked her up and she, uh, she's in a new home now. And, and so he actually he bought her from you. So how much did you buy her for and how much did you sell her for? Yeah, I was incredibly lucky. I bought her for 170 dinar. What is that? That's about 230 US dollars, I think. Okay. And I sold her for 140 dinar. Okay. So almost the same price. And I was really not fussed about the money. I just wanted her to find a a good home. Uh, But the money was a good bonus. So I almost had it for free. Yeah. Wow, and you got to train her, and, and he gets a yep. nice, well-trained donkey. Yeah, exactly. He's got the best donkey of Jordan, I reckon. Yeah. <laughs> Lucky man. Yeah. So when you, what was the end of the trail? Like, what was, I don't know, your final day? What what happens? You, you're walking, you're walking, and then the walking just stops. Yeah, and then the walking stops. And, um, yeah, so you sort of gets picked up by the car, and I get in another car. I managed to hitchhike back to the to the capital. On the day my plane leaves, so it was all very tight. We just about made it. And in five hours, we drive back what it took me five days to walk. And that's so surreal. And it's so weird to be back on the road and then in a big city. And, and in the airport, I was eating an apple. And I had to throw the core of the apple in the, in the garbage bin. I was like, this, this feels so wrong. I need to give this apple to you, Stra. Where is she? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's stepping rigorously in another world where you don't want to be. Yeah, and does it make you really, you know, like you said, five hours in the car and it took you, what did you say, five weeks on foot? Yeah. Does it really make you think twice about, I don't know, dri- even driving around in the Netherlands? You could drive the whole country in, what, an hour? <laughs> so yeah. Does it really make you think twice about, you know, do I actually know the land? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I I, I remember when I le- first uh, left Holland for over four years ago, I went on a bicycle and I saw all these places in my own country. I was like, wow, I've never been here. I didn't know it was so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> you only see highways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I really enjoy going slower and slower and slower. So whether it's on skis or snowshoes or on a horse or walking with the slow ways of traveling, really, maybe you see less, but you experience more. You're more part of it. Yeah. So you're back in in Netherlands. What what's next? Do you already have your next adventure planned or Yeah, so I just bought a tandem bike bicycle. <laughs> and my boyfriend came over from Australia and we're going to explore Europe on a tandem bike. Um so just that's just for fun now. In June and July I will be guiding groups in Mongolia and in September as well. Uh, so anybody, I had so many requests of people that heard my story. I'm like, wow, I want to ride a horse and a camel and meet these eagle hunters and go to the Altai Mountains. Can you help me out? So I started organizing this and I love to take people there. And then in October will be my big trip of this year. I'm renting reindeer in Siberia in the forests. And there's this ancient culture of reindeer herders living there still in their teepees like the Native Americans. Uh, most of them never even been in a city. They don't know our world and no one's ever been there. No journalist, um, no books have been written. So there's, well, almost no anyways. Um, people go to the first village where you can get 
sort of easily riding a horse one or two days. But no one really goes deeper into those taigas. And that's what I want to do. So I want to do it properly, <laughs> their way, on reindeer. And I arranged that I can rent a reindeer. And uh, I found a guy, a reindeer herder, that will teach me everything I need to know about reindeer. Because, again, it's a little bit different than a donkey and a camel and a horse. It's another animal. It eats other things. It needs to be in winter because they're really winter animals. I was there in summer to check it out and... These, these poor animals were panting, they were struggling with the heat. So good for them in winter, but obviously much harder for me in winter. And there will be bears and cougars and dangerous animals, and super remote. I won't have uh, the option of calling a helicopter if I'm in trouble. So this is going to be a great adventure to discover an ancient culture that I think is uh, very unique. So this is this is in Russia? It is in Mongolia, yeah, yeah in Mongolia. just on the, on the on the Russian border. Okay, so how do you find a guy with a reindeer who's renting a <laughs> yeah. deer? Yeah, so I went there last uh, last August. It was a six day uh, hike, uh, sorry, horse ride into those forests to find different families, and I took a translator with me to talk to them and see if uh, if they could help me and if they're even. You know, excited for me coming and doing this. If they're like, no, we we don't want foreigners here, then then that's okay. I don't come. But yeah, they're really excited. I never had this question before. If someone can rent a reindeer, and I took some test rides, they explained me a few things, and from one came another. Uh, I contacted people, and um, I'm going to be on Dutch television next year. So the lady that came to film us um, in February, last February in New Zealand, on our hunting trip was a Dutch TV crew that came to film us and she had been with these reindeer people as well, uh, the, the ones that are really close to town. And she had some contacts and I've been contacting them. And yeah, so just um, just a long process of preparation, but I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to work. <laughs> wow, and when are you planning this adventure? Yeah, this will be this year, October and November. September, October, November. Amazing. That sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited. Cool. So where where can we keep in touch with you so we can follow along on your, your awesome adventures? Yeah, yep. Um well I just built a website finally on the online. Uh it's called tamarvalkaneer.com. That's my name. I'm sure you'll write it down somewhere on the site. Yeah, we'll have some show notes available. Yeah, so you can read the entire blog of my Jordan trip. I wrote something almost every day. So it's a, it's a long story. If you have nothing better to do, you can read about that. You can find my upcoming trips, the ones I'm organizing. So there'll be a few Mongolia trips. I'm going to Kenya to stay with the Bushmen of the Maasai, learn their survival skills. Uh, in winter, I'm doing a female only uh, ski expedition in Norway and dog sledding and skiing and camping in the winter. Um, and we're going back to Jordan as well to do a camel trip and maybe another donkey trip. So, yeah, I'm, I'm organizing quite a few things. If you're interested, you can find it all on the on the website. So is this, uh, I have to ask, you know, you said you're traveling around, you're doing all these crazy adventures. How are you funding this? Like, what is your job? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm homeless and jobless. <laughs> um I know the feeling. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's great. I feel richer than ever. I have zero euros on my account. Um, yeah, this is this is what I do. I try to get a few dollars here and there, sometimes a presentation, sometimes a little article, and sometimes I take uh, groups. But to be honest, I don't make any money of it. I just play even. And I give all the money I make to the nomads and the Bedouins. <laughs> uh, I need to, to become a better business person, but... Um, yeah, as long as I'm playing even, I'm, I'm happy. We'll see what comes from it. Okay, everyone listening. So if you take a trip with, with Tamar, just remember to tip her at least 100 euros. <laughs> 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 hey. So the next donkey will be on, on the listeners, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. After every trip with an animal, I say, I don't want to do it again because it's too heartbreaking to let them go. I'm, I'll never buy another animal and... Then as soon as I can, I will, of course. <laughs> so, so how many animals do you own in all of these countries? <laughs> uh, three, four, five. <laughs> uh, only five. <laughs> okay. just, just five. That, that's not too bad. I have only one heart to break, though. It's already broken five times. It's oh, too hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. 
no, no, it's all good. It's uh, yeah, it's amazing. It's good, good experience. Well, very cool. Okay, so obviously we could be we could be talking all day. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have to bring you back on. We're gonna have to cover your Mongolia adventures, of course, and then your reindeer adventure when you do that. If if I'm not joining you, that is. Ah, yeah. <laughs> if yeah, I join absolutely. you, then we'll just podcast on the way. Yeah, yeah, perfect. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Tamar, for coming on and, and sharing your adventures. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was great. Did Tamar's story make your feet itch? Do you want to find amazing horse riding places all around the world? Then make your dreams come true with our free download, Horse Riding in Every Country. This catalog features more than 400 stables in over 180 different countries. And let me tell you, there's countries on there like Gambia, and I'm sure a whole bunch of places you've probably never even heard of. So be sure to check it out on our website. You have been listening to the Equestrian Adventuresses podcast. Please subscribe to our channel and check out our website, equestrianadventuresses.com, for links to the show notes. Leave us a review and consider becoming a premium member for bonus episodes and footage. More information can be found on our website. Until next time, adventuresses, happy trails. Happy trails.